Chapter Eight of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter Eight: The Baby of the Regiment. We were in our winter camp on Port Royal Island. It was a lovely November morning, soft and spring-like. The mockingbirds were singing, and the cotton fields still white with fleecy pods. Morning drill was over. The men were cleaning their guns and singing very happily. The officers were in their tents, reading still more happily. The letters arrived from home. Suddenly, I heard a knock at my tent door, and the latch clicked. It was the only latch in the camp, and I was very proud of it. And the officers always clicked it as loudly as possible in order to gratify my feelings. The door opened, and the quartermaster thrust in the most beaming face I ever saw. Colonel said he, "There are great news for the regiment. My wife and baby are coming by the next steamer." Baby said I in amazement, "Q M, you are beside yourself." We always called the quartermaster Q M for shortness. There was a pass sent to your wife, but nothing was ever said about a baby. Baby indeed. But the baby was included in the pass," replied the triumphant father of a family. "You don't suppose my wife would come down here without her baby? Besides, the pass itself permits her to bring necessary baggage, and is not a baby six months old necessary baggage?" "But, my dear fellow," said I rather anxiously, "how can you make a little thing comfortable in a tent amidst these rigors of a South Carolina winter, when it is uncomfortably hot for drill at noon and ice forms in your bedside at night?" Trust me for that," said the delighted papa, and went off whistling. I could hear him telling the same news to three others at least before he got to his own tent. That day the preparations began, and soon his abode was a wonderful comfort. There were posts and rafters and a raised floor and a great chimney and a door with hinges, every luxury except a latch, and that he could not have, for mine was the last that could be purchased. One of the regimental carpenters was employed to make a cradle, and another to make a bedstead high enough for the cradle to go under. Then there must be a bit of red carpet beside the bedstead, and thus the progress of splendor went on. The wife of one of the colored sergeants was engaged to act as a nursery maid. She was a very respectable young woman. The only objection to her being that she smoked a pipe, but we thought perhaps a baby might not dislike tobacco, and if she did, she would have excellent opportunities. To break the pipe in pieces. In due time, the steamer arrived, and baby and her mother were among the passengers. The little recruit was soon settled in a new cradle and slept in it as if she had never known any other. The sergeant's wife soon had her on exhibition through the neighbourhood, and from that time forward, she was quite a queen among us. She had sweet blue eyes and pretty brown hair with round dimpled cheeks, and that perfect dignity which is so beautiful in a baby. She hardly ever cried and was not at all timid. She would go to anybody and yet did not encourage any romping from any but the most intimate friends. She always wore a warm, long-sleeved scarlet cloak with a hood, and in this costume was carried or toted, as the soldiers said, all about the camp. At guard mounting in the morning, when the men who were to go on guard duty for the day are drawn up to be inspected, baby was always there to help inspect them. She did not say much. But she eyed them very closely and seemed fully to appreciate their bright buttons. Then the officer of the day, who appears at guard mounting with his sword and sash and comes afterwards to the colonel's tent for orders, would come and speak to baby on his way and receive her orders first. When the time came for drill, she was usually present to watch the troops, and when the drum beat for dinner, she liked to see the long row of men in each company march up to the cookhouse in single file, each with a tin cup and plate. During the day, in pleasant weather, she might be seen in her nurse's arms about the company streets, and centre of an admiring circle. Her scarlet costume looking very pretty amidst the shining black cheeks and neat blue uniforms of the soldiers. At dress parade, just before sunset, she was always an attendant. As I stood before the regiment, I could see the little spots of red out of the corner of my eye at one end of the long line of men, and I looked with so much interest for her small person that instead of saying at the proper time. Attention, battalion! Shoulder arms! It is a wonder that I did not say, "Shoulder babies!" 
Our little lady was very impartial, and distributed her kind looks to everybody. She had not the slightest prejudice against colour, and did not care in the least whether her particular friends were black or white. Her especial friends, I think, were the drummer boys, who were not my favourites by any means, for they were a roguish set of scamps, and gave more trouble than all the grown men in the regiment. I think Annie liked them because they were small, and made a noise, and had red caps like her hood, and red facings on their jackets, and also because they occasionally stood on their heads for her amusement. After dress parade, the whole drum corps would march to the great flag staff, and wait till just sunset time, when they would beat the retreat, and then the flag would be hauled down, a great festival for Annie. Sometimes the sergeant major would wrap her in the great folds of the flag, after it was taken down, and she would peep out very prettily from amidst the stars and stripes, like a new-born goddess of liberty. About once a month some inspecting officer was sent to the camp by the general in command, to see the condition of everything in the regiment, from bayonets to buttons. It was usually a long and tiresome process, and when everything was done, I used to tell the officer that I had one more thing for him to inspect, which was peculiar to our regiment. Then I would send for baby to be exhibited, and I never saw an inspecting officer, old or young, who did not look pleased at the sudden appearance of the little fresh smiling creature, a flower in the midst of war. And Annie, in her turn, would look at them, with the true baby dignity la her face, that deep, earnest look which babies often have, and which people think so wonderful when Raphael paints it, although they might often see just the same expression in the faces of their own darlings at home. Meanwhile, Annie seemed to like the camp style of housekeeping very much. Her father's tent was double, and he used the front apartment for his office, and the inner room for parlour and bedroom, while the nurse had a separate tent and washroom behind all. I remember that, for the first time I went there in the evening, it was to borrow some writing paper, and while baby's mother was hunting for it in the front tent, I heard a great cooing and murmuring in the inner room. I asked if Annie was still awake, and her mother told me to go in and see. Pushing aside the canvas door, I entered. No sign of anybody was to be seen, but a variety of soft little happy noises seemed to come from some unseen corner. Mrs. C. came quietly in, pulled away the counterpane of her own bed, and drew out the rough cradle where lay the little damsel, perfectly happy, and wider awake than anything but a baby possibly can be. She looked as if the seclusion of a dozen family bedsteads would not be enough to discourage her spirits, and I saw that camp life was likely to suit her very well. A tent can be kept very warm, for it is merely a house with a thinner wall than usual, and I do not think that the baby felt the cold much more than if she had been at home that winter. The great trouble is that a tent chimney not being built very high is apt to smoke when the wind is in a certain direction, and when that happens it is hardly possible to stay inside. So we used to build the chimneys of some tents on the east side, and those of others on the west, and thus some of the tents were always comfortable. I have seen baby's mother running in a hard rain with little red riding hood in her arms to take refuge with the adjutant's wife when every other abode was full of smoke. And I must admit that there was one or two windy days that season when nobody could really keep warm, and Annie had to remain ignomiously in her cradle, with as many clothes on as possible, for almost the whole time. The quartermaster's tent was very attractive to us in the evening. I remember that once on passing near it after nightfall, I heard our major's fine voice singing Methodist hymns within, and Mrs. C.'s sweet tones chiming in. So I peeped through the outer door. The fire was burning very pleasantly in the inner tent, and the scrap of new red carpet made the floor look quite magnificent. The major sat on a box, our surgeon on a stool. Q.M. and his wife's, and the adjutant's wife, and one of the captains, were all sitting on the bed, singing as well as they knew how, and the baby was under the bed. Baby had retired for the night, was overshadowed, suppressed, sat upon, and the singing went on, and she had wandered away in her own land of dreams, nearer to heaven, perhaps, than any pitch their voices could attain. I went in and joined the party. Presently the music stopped, and another officer was sent for, to sing some particular song. At this pause the invisible innocent waked a little, and began to cluck and coo. "'It's the kitten!' exclaimed somebody. "'It's my baby!' exclaimed Mrs. C. triumphantly, in that tone unfailing personal pride which belongs to young mothers. The people all got up from the bed for a moment, while Annie was pulled from beneath, wide awake and placid as usual. 
She sat in one lap after another during the rest of the concert, sometimes winking at the candle, but usually listening to the songs, with a calm and critical expression, as if she could make as much noise as any of them, whenever she saw fit to try. Not a sound did she make, however, except one little soft sneeze, which led to an immediate flood-tide of red shawl, covering every part of her but her forehead. But I soon hinted that the concert had better be ended, because I knew from observation that the small damsel had carefully watched a regimental inspection and a brigade jill on that day, and that an interval of repose was certainly necessary. Annie did not long remain the only baby in camp. One day, on going out to the stables to look at a horse, I heard a sound of baby talk addressed by some man to a child nearby, and looking round the corner of a tent, I saw that one of the hostlers had something black and round lying in the sloping side of a tent, with which he was playing very eagerly. It proved to be his baby, a plump, shiny thing, younger than Annie, and I never saw a merrier picture than the happy father frolicking with his child, while the mother stood quietly by. This was baby number two, and she stayed in camp several weeks, the two innocents meeting each other every day in the placid indifference that belonged to their years. Both were happy little healthy things, and it never seemed to cross their minds that there was any difference in their complexions. As I said before, Annie was not troubled by any prejudice in regard to colour, nor do I suppose that the other little maiden was. Annie enjoyed the tent life very much, but when we were sent out on picket soon after, she enjoyed it still more. Our headquarters was at a deserted plantation house with one large parlour, a dining room, and a few bedrooms. Baby's father and mother had a room upstairs with a stove whose pipe went straight out at the window. This was quite comfortable, though half the windows were broken, and there was no glass and no glazier to mend them. The windows of the large parlour were in much the same condition, though we had an immense fireplace, where we had a bright fire whenever it was cold, and always in the evening. The walls of this room were very dirty, and it took our ladies several days to cover all the unsightly places with wreaths and hangings of evergreen. In the performance, Baby took an active part. Her duties consisted in sitting in a great nest of evergreen, pulling and fingering the fragrant leaves, and occasionally giving a little cry of glee when she had accomplished some piece of decided mischief. There was less entertainment to be found in the camp itself at this time, but we, the household at headquarters, was larger than Baby had been accustomed to. We had a great deal of company, moreover, and she had quite a gay life of it. She usually made her appearance in the large parlour soon after breakfast, and to dance her for a few moments in our arms was one of the first daily duties of each one. Then the morning reports began to arrive from different outposts, a mounted officer or courier coming in from each place, dismounting at the door, and clattering in with jingling arms and spurs, each a new excitement for Annie. She usually got some attention from any officer who came, receiving with her wanted dignity any daring caress. When the messengers had ceased to be interesting, there was always the horses to look at, held or tethered under the trees beside the sunny piazza. After the various couriers had been received, other messengers would be dispatched to the town, several miles away, and Baby had full of excitement of the mounting and departure. Her father was often one of the riders, and would sometimes seize Annie for a good-bye kiss, place her on the saddle before him, gallop her round the house once or twice, and then give her back to the nurse's arms again. She was perfectly fearless, and such boisterous attention never frightened her, nor did they ever interfere with her sweet, infantine self-possession. After the riding parties had gone, there was the piazza still for entertainment, with a sentinel pacing up and down before it. But Annie did not enjoy the sentinel, though his breastplate and buttons shone like gold, so much as the hammock which always hung swinging between the pillars. It was a pretty hammock, with great open meshes, and she delighted to lie in it, and have the netting closed above her, so that she could only be seen through the apertures. I can see her now, the fresh little rosy thing in her blue and scarlet wrappings, with one round and dimpled arm thrust forth through the netting, and the other grasping an armful of blushing roses and fragrant magnolias. She looked like those pretty French bass reliefs of cupids imprisoned in baskets, and peeping through. That hammock was a very useful appendage. It was a couch for us, a cradle for baby, a nest for the kittens, and we had, moreover, a little hen which liked to roost there every night. When the mornings were colder, and the stove upstairs smoked the wrong way, Baby was brought down in a very incomplete state of toilet, 
and finished her dressing by the great fire. We found her bare shoulders very becoming, and she was still very much interested in her own pink toes. After a very slow dressing, she had still a slower breakfast, out of a tin cup of warm milk, of which she generally spilt a good deal, as she had much to do in watching everybody who came into the room, and seeing that there was no mischief done. Then she would be placed on the floor, on our only piece of carpet, and the kittens would be brought in for her to play with. We had at different times a variety of pets, of whom Annie did not take much notice. Sometimes we had young partridges caught by the drummer boys in trap cages. The children called them Bob and Chloe, because the first notes of the male and female sounded like those names. One day I brought home an opossum, with a blind bear young still clinging to the droll pouch where their mothers keep them. Sometimes we had pretty green lizards, their colour darkening or deepening like that of chameleons, in light or shade. But the only pets that took baby's fancy were the kittens. They perfectly delighted her from the first moment she saw them, and they were the only things younger than herself that she had ever beheld, and the only things softer than themselves that her small hands had grasped. It was astonishing to see how much the kittens would endure from her. They could scarcely be touched by anyone else without mewing, but when Annie seized one by the head and the other by the tail and rubbed them violently together, they did not make a sound. I suppose that a baby's grasp is really soft, even if it seems ferocious, and so it gives less pain than one would think. At any rate, the little animals had the best of it very soon, for they entirely outstripped Annie in learning to walk, and they could soon scramble away beyond her reach, while she sat in a soft, dumb despair, unable to comprehend why anything so much smaller than herself could be so much more nimble. Meanwhile the kittens would sit up, look at her with the most provoking indifference just out of her arm's length, until some of us would take pity on the young lady and toss her furry playthings back to her again. Little baby, she learned to call them, and these were the very first words she spoke. Baby had evidently a natural turn for war, further cultivated by an intimate knowledge of drills and parades. The nearer she came to actual conflict, the better she seemed to like it, peaceful as her own little ways might be. Twice at least, while she was with us on picket, we had alarms from the rebel troops, who would bring down cannon to the opposite side of the ferry about two miles beyond us, and throw shot and shell over our side. Then the officer at the ferry would think that there was to be an attack made, and couriers would be sent riding to and fro, and the men would all be called to arms in a hurry, and the ladies at headquarters would all put on their best bonnets and come down the stairs, and the ambulance would be made ready to carry them to a place of safety before the expected fight. On such occasions Baby was all in her glory. She shouted with delight at being suddenly uncribbed and thrust into a little scarlet cloak, and brought downstairs at an utterly unusual and improper hour to a piazza with lights and people and horses and general excitement. She crowed and gurgled and made gestures with her little fists, and screamed out what seemed to be her advice on the military situation, as freely as if she had been a newspaper editor. Except that it was rather difficult to understand her precise direction, I do not know, but the whole rebel force might have been captured through her plans. But at any rate, I should much rather obey her orders than those of some generals whom I have known, for she at least meant no harm, and would lead one into no mischief. However, at last the danger, such as it was, would all be over, and the ladies would be induced to go peacefully to bed again, and Annie would retreat with them to her ignoble cradle, very much disappointed, and looking vainly back to the more martial scene below. The next morning she would seem to have forgotten all about it, and would spill her bread and milk by the fire, as if nothing had happened. I suppose we hardly knew at the time how large a part of the sunshine of our daily lives was contributed by dear little Annie. Yet when I look back on that pleasant southern home, she seems as essential a part of it as the mockingbirds or the magnolias, and I cannot convince myself that in returning to it I should not find her there. But Annie went back with the spring to her northern birthplace, and then passed away from this earth before her little feet had fairly learned to tread its paths, and when I meet her next it must be in some world where there is triumph without armies, and where innocence is trained in scenes of peace. I know, however, that her little life, short as it seemed, was a blessing to us all, giving us a perpetual image of serenity and sweetness, recalling the lovely atmosphere of far-off homes, and holding us 
by unsuspected ties to whatever things were pure. End of chapter 8 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk